<laughs> okay, well, um, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. So uh, I'm David Hannon, and uh, this is um, a visiting artist from uh, New York, uh, Katie Bell. I have a video that Audrey uh, Barchio um, recorded for this, so I'll play that now, introducing this person. Hello, I'm Audrey Barcio, Assistant Professor of Painting at Ball State University, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce our visiting artist today, Katie Bell. Katie Bell is originally from Rockford, Illinois, and currently lives in Brooklyn. She receives her BA from Knox College in Fine Art, Race, and Gender Studies, with an MFA in Painting from the Rhode Island School of Art and Design. Katie's work has been exhibited at Mixed Greens Gallery in New York, which is where I first encountered her work, Storefront in Bushwick, Brooklyn, Plug Projects in Kansas City, OK Mountain Gallery in Austin, Texas, and the DeCorvida Sculpture Park and Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Katie has been awarded Artist in Residence at the Marie Sharp Space Program based in Brooklyn and recently was awarded a fellowship by the New York Foundation for the Arts. Currently, Katie is preparing for a solo show at Locust Projects in Miami, Florida. Now let's give Katie a warm welcome from her studio today in Brooklyn. Thanks. Thanks so much, Audrey, uh, for facilitating the visit. And I really appreciate everyone tuning in kind of wherever, wherever you may be. I know that um, Right now, that could be your house or uh, the studio. So I really appreciate everybody taking some time in this really kind of unusual circumstance. Uh, I first wanted to start out by kind of acknowledging the oddity of this space for a lecture and also um, the kind of oddity, I'm sure a lot of you are kind of learning through demos online and virtual space. And I've been thinking a lot um, like everybody about this screen kind of as a new framing device for my work. And so I thought, um, I'm in my studio today, uh, it's in Brooklyn, or it's in uh, Manhattan in the East Village, I live in Brooklyn. And I thought, um, why not use some visual aids uh, kind of as a, as a way to introduce you to my work. I think there's certain things that Zoom kind of allows that if I were on campus in a lecture hall, just wouldn't be available. Um, to me. And so I thought it would be a nice way to introduce you to my work by using some kind of physical objects. So I wanted to start the lecture by thinking about what the computer space is, what painting space is, what's a frame. When I gather material in my studio, I'm often thinking about what's its weight, what's its shape, what's its color. And I think about this kind of Zoom space or Screen space is a way to explore some of these ideas. My background is totally in painting. I took painting classes in college and ended up getting my MFA in painting, but I think I've kind of come to painting through sculpture and through materials. And when I'm looking for objects to work with, a lot of the objects I'm working with are found, some are fabricated, but it's a combination of these items. And I think about the studio space much like the Zoom space and this kind of white cube I've constructed on Zoom as almost this like experimentation space where 
I can look at things isolated and think about things in a new light separate from maybe where they came from, which is often on the street or found in junkyards, metal yards, And when I'm kind of making my large scale installations, it really starts to kind of function like this space, almost a collage space or a painting space. And this space obviously is a tabletop and so things have a certain amount of gravity to them. Often I'm working on the wall and the kind of gravity starts to take control of the objects. And so often I'm working on the ground and then kind of constructing these things. Um, bird's eye view on a ladder and then kind of moving them to the wall. And so a lot of these objects that I'm working with have almost like a, a faux surface. I'm interested in an object like this that is a shard from a hot tub. So it's a piece of fiberglass, but it kind of resembles granite or a rock. Um, same with this kind of Corian column that I fabricated. A lot of these things start to kind of act as if they're meant to look like something else, as if the as if the object has a costume on or it's in disguise. So it's kind of dressing up to be a rock or a piece of stone, um, marble. I'm really interested in kind of how these textures start to act like just abstract painting marks. When you get really close up to the object, it's as if it's it's just you know, stippled painting techniques. And so I'm often looking for things that kind of, you know, uh, mimic a painting language and um, mimic painting language in relationship to kind of interior design. And so the studio kind of often acts like this site, almost like a laboratory. And often when I'm walking around and kind of surveying the street to find things like this, like this was just found on the street outside my studio. I'm trying to think about it in this kind of, this blank space where it can kind of be divorced from its prior life and prior history and have a new history, but also kind of bring in um, its past into the work. And so often I'm looking for things that are, abstract in nature. They don't have too much specific information in terms of um, maybe a date or a time period or a pattern that would kind of, um, you know, put it in a certain time period. I'm looking for things that can kind of have this elemental quality where it's a shape of color. I wanted to share with you just a few kind of snippets from the studio that I often look at that if you were in my studio, uh, you would see as you're walking around. And so some, some artwork that's been really influential to me, uh, Robert Morris's scatter piece. Franz Erhard Walter's work, which is um, very performative and kind of textile based abstraction, thinking a lot about the alphabet. Um, and the work of Wade Guyton, specifically the kind of chair pieces, uh, the deconstructed chair pieces, where it's kind of taking a, a really kind of simple element that was once part of something much larger and more specific, but paring it down to this kind of line and space or form of abstraction. In addition to looking at other artwork, I'm always kind of making rubbings of things, textures in the world that I can't take with me. For instance, this is the, um, the floor of my shower at home. 
So thinking through textures and line and what I can bring into the work that, that sometimes I can't physically carry into the studio. I'm gonna share my screen next and kind of transition into looking through some past images of work. Can you all see that okay? Yes, sorry, I can't see anybody, but yes. So um, this is a, a large installational work that I did most recently um, at Hall Walls, which is a kind of nonprofit art institution, long running space in Buffalo, New York. And I wanted to share this because it's really where my head is at right now. The title of the show was Abstract Cabinet. And I started thinking through what if a room or a gallery could act as a kind of a, a holder for abstraction, often like a kind of um, stretcher bar would for the kind of support of an abstract painting. I was thinking about like, what if the kind of walls and floor and ceiling really become a container for abstraction? And this is a lot of the ideas I, I think about kind of consistently. And so this project, um, much like most of my work, um, some of it is made at the studio and then some of it is made on site depending on uh, where the show is. And that's really kind of opened up a, a freedom in my work in terms of the kind of scale I can work with. Um, I think early on, especially when I was in school, scale, um, I could work as large as I wanted uh, because I was in a kind of school setting and I wasn't thinking about storage and transportation at the time. And there was freedom in that and it allowed the work to really grow in a way that I don't think, um, I don't think I would have if I didn't have those kind of limitations taken away. And so in order to kind of continue to work in that way, because my work often gets really large in scale and it is site specific, I make a lot of it on site. And so for instance, this show in Buffalo, a lot of the large platforms were made on site. And then in addition to kind of making objects on site, um, this is a show at Illinois State University um, in Bloomington Normal. And so in addition to making those kind of objects, I can then also scavenge for materials on site, which really is, uh, I think, brought a specificity to the work that I wouldn't have anticipated. Um, I think at first when I started working in this way, it was a bit intimidating. Um, but when I kind of allowed myself to work more um, immediately and specifically to the site I was working, it really allowed the work to kind of push forward. And so a lot of the larger kind of found objects I scavenged for the city, in the city uh, in which the show is in. And much like uh, the show at Hallwells and the show at Illinois State, I've really been thinking through kind of uh, that gallery as stage space or gallery as container of a space for abstraction. And it really becomes kind of the viewer's role of walking through the painting space versus maybe looking at it like a traditional uh, abstract painting. And so often photography in my work, uh, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword in that it, it really kind of shows one point perspective, but um, when the work is experienced in person, you're really kind of walking around the objects and the, the things are kind of um, activated in that. I've been looking at a lot of Russian constructivist theater. Um, I got interested in that a few months ago and I got really intrigued by the idea of um, the stage is just as, an, as important as the actors. And that really made me think just the idea I was saying where, oh, the gallery is just as important as the, as the artwork or the viewer's experience of walking through the artwork is just as important as 
the floor, the ceiling, the walls, and then everything that maybe I'm bringing into it or responding to the space. Um, and so this image in particular, it's kind of this book image, um, you know, acting as these like nooks where actors can perform. And I love that idea. Um, also, El Lizitsky's prune rooms. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with these or have seen these, but um, they're from the 1920s. A few of them were made. And the idea is that it's, I believe he said it's the interchange station between painting and architecture. And I thought, oh, that's such an amazing way of thinking about space and painting and what you bring into a space. Um, and so he's somebody that kind of keeps coming back into my work and thinking about what are, what are the ways that I can make these interchange stations between painting and architecture. Um, also influential uh, a bit later in time, Kay Sage, a surrealist who kind of never really got her due in her day, um, but she makes these kind of amazing paintings that feel as though the actor has just left or maybe the, the stage space is kind of waiting for the next act to happen. And I love that kind of suspense in her work where it almost feels as though movement is taking place, but it, it hasn't yet, or it's this kind of freeze frame or stillness in the work. And that's something too that I think part of my interest in painting is that stillness. And there's something about installation and sculpture that's inherently active. And I think a painting space often for me has a stillness. And so I love the idea that an artist can kind of control that space and that the viewer can stand in front of the work of art and you can, you know, you can show them what you want them to see versus installation and sculpture when the viewer is walking around, there's, there's kind of much more, um, it invites the viewer to make more decisions. And I think I'm always trying to kind of grapple between the two, uh, wanting that kind of forced perspective of a painting, but also being so interested in the material of things and, and what they do in a space. I just wanted to show you a few other examples of my work for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, but as I said, my background really is in painting. I started making paintings of interior room spaces um, like I was when I was in college and, and somewhat in grad school. And these interior room spaces would always kind of have a sense, just as I was saying, this kind of like the event was just about to happen or it just had happened and it was in this kind of freeze frame state. And so I started making really large scale charcoal acrylic drawings on paper, similar in scale to this work actually, like mural scale, where I was connecting large sheets of paper together and working on the wall. Um, and in order to make these drawings, I started making really complicated still lives in my studio. And the still lives would be, you know, I'd paint wallpaper, I'd maybe grab a couch from Goodwill, um, and really kind of deconstruct and construct the space in order to then make a drawing from. And, and I think as time went on, there, there started to be more of an investment in what I considered at the time the still lives versus the actual drawings and paintings I was making based off of the still lives. It's as if those drawings and paintings just were kind of after the fact, like all of the decisions and the excitement and the kind of, you know, the creative energy was really flowing in the way I was making the, the, the still lives, but then the paintings just kind of felt like a remnant of that process. And so slowly but surely, I kind of stopped making drawings and paintings and really almost brought more drawing and painting into these still lives that I was constructing. And so all of the decisions that I, I think that many of us make when we're thinking about painting, color, weight, shape, depth of field, texture, um, you know, getting the perfect 
uh, gessoed surface, sanding things down, like all of that material stuff is still really interesting to me. But I feel as though I'm kind of skipping some steps and kind of translating it through material I find versus mixing the color and, um, you know, kind of creating illusionistic things. And I think the scale also is something that has really kept the work going for me. I think there was something when I was making paintings that I was somebody that I was like a, a standing artist. I wanted to stand and make the thing. Sitting at a table wasn't really that interesting to me. Um, being physical with objects was. I have a background um, in college playing volleyball and I sometimes I think about that actually being really influential. Um, I don't think I would have been able to say that in the moment, but after the fact, I think there's this kind of competition with something that is really driving to me and specifically dealing with materials that are a little bit too hard to handle or um, you know, a bit of strength to get them together, by all means necessary creating this thing uh, that really motivated me. And I think I was only able to recognize that, that later. So this is a image actually um, of where I'm sitting right now in my studio. And I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of behind the scenes in terms of how these things get into the world um, before I show up to the gallery or the site in which the show is at. So this is a model. Um, in its very rough state. I make a model for every project that I do. And for me, the model really acts like a three-dimensional drawing. So different than maybe architecture models or something of that nature, they're not meant to be totally exact or exactly to scale. It's taking a, a simple sketch in my sketchbook and kind of one-upping it to the physical. So I can really play around with objects and material and think through the space before I get there. And a lot of the, so this is the show in, in real life. Um, a lot of the objects I'm making, as you can see, are very large and often an investment in terms of just cost in terms of materials. Um, and so, you know, I kind of want to have a, a sense before I commit to something. It's very rare that the model kind of turns out exactly like the project. It's more of this kind of three-dimensional play space where I can mess around, bring it to the show where I'm installing, try something out really quickly versus hauling something really large around in the space to then place it. This is a large, my largest kind of show to date um, that was at Smack Mellon here in Brooklyn. And it definitely was the most kind of full room installation that I've made. And as you can see, the space itself posed a lot of interesting challenges. And in my mind, the space kind of it's almost an artwork in itself. It's so specific in terms of how many columns are in the space. It used to be kind of an old coal mining facility. So there's all of these kind of industrial contraptions on the ceiling. And so figuring out a way to kind of take over the space, but also embrace the space was really important to me. So as you can kind of see this platform in the center goes around one of the existing columns in the space. And then there's a lot of things that kind of happened. It's a little bit hard to see in this image, but um, on the back kind of left wall, there is a mark that goes into the drywall of the gallery. I've been using um, a wood router as a drawing tool and kind of thinking about how I can take away material as well as add material. And this is, um, a fabricated rock and column that went around an existing column in the space. And so I was really thinking about how can my work 
feel as though maybe it's trying to hold up the whole structure by itself. Like if my work wasn't there, would, would the building fall over? And that's something that I keep thinking about in some future shows I have coming up is how can I nod to the architecture in a way that it feels as though it's dependent on my work, but my work is also dependent on the architecture itself. Um, and so you can kind of see the scale ranges a bit. This is kind of a smaller scale work for me. The title of this piece is called Casualties. Um, but, you know, quite large. I think it's like 17 feet by eight feet tall. And same thing, thinking about this stage space, almost where every object that I bring into the space is an actor. And maybe this actor is in motion, maybe it's still, maybe it's having a conversation with a fellow actor on stage. But these kind of um, ideas of theatrics, ballet, moving through a stage space has become really interesting to me in thinking about painting language. And then of course, just bringing objects into this kind of white cube gallery world space. I wanted to share with you, I think a lot of the time um, when I'm listening to artists speak, I like to kind of see the, the behind the scenes, the stuff you can't really see on the internet. And a huge part of my just time spent as an artist is doing things like this, just going out and looking for materials. Um, so this is in Miami a couple of years ago where I'm uh, at a site looking for kind of debris for a sculpture I was working on there. And as I kind of mentioned, the site in which the show is at is so important in shaping the work. Um, for instance, work I've made in Miami inherently because of Miami and its culture and the sun, it just has a different palette, I think, than work maybe I would make in Chicago um, or Iowa or anywhere. Um, Miami has everything sun bleached because it's sitting outside. So it, it's a bit faded, it's a bit pastel. It's a much more kind of, um, modern city than like Buffalo, New York, where Miami's acrylics and plastics and laminates and veneers and aluminum. Whereas if you go to Buffalo, New York, you're looking at when you scavenge marble and wood and things that are very worn that have been there for a hundred years or more. Uh, this is actually an image from Buffalo when I was scavenging for material. And so often the, just what I find in terms of the color and the texture and the material, it feels almost so specific to a place. And so I love making work actually outside of my studio on site because the city presents me with things I wouldn't have encountered in my, in my daily routine. And it starts to shape the work and it speaks to the place in which it's made. And a lot of, um, a lot of the things I'm kind of looking for when I'm out in the world, I kind of talked about it a little bit when I was um, working with the objects here, is it's a really particular type of object where for instance, the image here of the green plastic slide, taken out of context of maybe a playset, it really starts to become almost this green abstract squiggle from like a, I don't know, some sort of, uh, you know, Frank Stella painting or something. And uh, that becomes really interesting to me where it had a function in its previous life, but how can I kind of take it from its, from its habitat, bring it to my studio and transform it to be something a bit different. Um, I think that a lot of times 
it'll be something that hasn't had so much wear that it feels too particular to a place. So if it's really rusty or dirty in a way that I wouldn't be able to clean, I get less interested in it because I think then it speaks to the, the wear and the age of that object versus just its kind of color, shape and form. And when I'm kind of out in the world, there's, there's things that I can take with me, things I find on the street or in a junkyard or a salvage yard. And then there's some things that you see that you just can't take with you, like this image. Um, this was at a hotel I was at maybe, I don't know, eight months ago earlier this year. And there's something that was so specific about this, you know, it's plastic, fake marble, shower stall thing. Um, but I love this idea of a little compartment, um, something that holds something else. How can I incorporate that into my work? And so I'm always on my phone taking pictures of these things and compiling. And then there's this, this happened yesterday actually. Um, it's outside where I live in Brooklyn and there's often just kind of like various movie TV show things being filmed. And this was just a huge fake boulder. It's totally fiberglass, plastic, really lightweight. You could go and push it. Um, there's something so comical about that to me. And if you were to get up close to it, it's really noticeably plastic. It's all scratched and you, you can see it's not a rock. And I love the kind of comedy in that, inherently in that object. It's silly because it's so huge and it, it looks so substantial. But then you think about it as plastic, it's totally ridiculous. Um, also ridiculous in my mind that these things are even produced. Um, you think maybe in like a hundred years, an object like this maybe gets buried or thrown out in a landfill and somebody discovers it. And it's this really confusing kind of smoothie of a landscape where you're, you're digging and you're like, okay, dirt, dirt. And then you come upon this and you're kind of, you know, huh, is this, what is this? Is this a, this is a rock. And then no, it's a fake rock. And maybe this is next to something like, I don't know, like fish tank gravel, you know, little pebbles that I think are pebbles, but they're painted neon green. And then maybe that's next to, I don't know, something like the objects I showed you before, which, you know, this is like a fake little column that I think goes in a fish tank. And all of a sudden, everything just gets so confusing. And I think there's just something really interesting to me conceptually about that. And I'm always thinking about that in my work. Then there's other things, of course, that you can, you can just take with you. And so I'm somebody that's always looking for things on the street, grabbing things out of garbage. My pockets are always filled with items. Um, and these are just, I think they're like pool balls, um, like the cue ball. And these things just float around in the studio and often it takes a really long time for them to get used. Um, I've had some of my objects for over 10 years and, and then other things, you know, get used really quickly right away. And so it's a, it's a large collection um, that starts to act like a catalog. And I think that's partially why I really enjoy going and working on site because I can only kind of bring a, a limited amount from the catalog and then I get to add new things. And um, as you might imagine, storage for me is a, is a big issue uh, in terms of space, especially living in New York. And so I'm always thinking about how can I reuse things into other work? Um, you know, what is the most important thing for me to hang on to and, and what needs to kind of get recycled? Um, this was this amazing, uh, there's a gem show in Arizona every year. Um, and this, I went a couple years ago and, and this was an image from that. And I just, the, 
I mean, this is in some ways this image next to the boulder, the movie set boulder, it's this total utter absurdity um, where, you know, this is a crazy expensive, I don't know, some sort of like rose gemstone that they're trying to sell at this, uh, at this auction show thing, but it's just, you know, strapped down. Uh, there's just this kind of utter, I love the, the by all means necessary, we're just strapping this thing down um, to kind of control it in this way and move it around. Like it's very functional, but at the same time, it, it's, it's holding this really kind of precious thing that ultimately was, uh, you know, excavated from the earth. Uh, and to me, when you come upon something like this, it's just, it's so magical because it's just my work kind of wrapped in a, in a package, a conceptual package, I think. Also from the gem show. And I just, I think it's really important, um, especially just like when you're in school and being an artist, um, it's really easy, I think, to see work online in this kind of photographed format, not really understanding how it's made or maybe what goes into the making process. So again, I'm just showing you some of the, the travels that end up almost being kind of 50% of the studio work is really traveling around, um, this is in Pennsylvania, looking for material. And I always, um, this, is, this is the kind of holy grail of material sites that I've ever, ever come upon. And I've now been going to this site for about eight, nine years now. Um, but this is in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. I had been looking for a hot tub actually. Um, I got really interested in the kind of faux finish surface, this fake rock, um, this almost luxurious wave to the kind of contours and curves of the seats of a hot tub. And I was thinking about making a sculpture with one, maybe cutting it up. And so I had my eyes, you know, peeled for a free hot tub. Uh, of course, in, in New York City, those are maybe non-existent, uh, very rare. Um, but I was driving along in Pennsylvania, actually meeting my partner's parents for the first time for Thanksgiving. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw just a corner of a hot tub in this kind of field detritus land. Um, then realized it was attached to this pool and spa store, Bartos Pools and Spa, and realized, oh my gosh, like we have to go, we have to go investigate. And realized it's just this hot tub junkyard graveyard trash site where it's just all of these discarded, discarded hot tubs um, just get dumped there. And so I thought, oh, like, this is the mothership. This is, you know, this is the, the, the you know, the hot tub gods have rained down and they've presented me with this, this spot. And I've been, so anyways, I made friends with uh, Amy Barto who owns the store and kind of embarrassingly, she, she just puts old hot tubs in this field behind her store. And she kind of keeps meaning to deal with it, but never gets around to it. And she's just this amazing character kind of out of, I don't know, like a film from the seventies or something where she's wearing almost like terry cloth slippers and has this amazing kind of bob haircut. And to my surprise, she was just really receptive to me being an artist and my project. And I got really excited by that because often when you kind of present yourself as an artist, sometimes people kind of, you know, uh, shy away a bit. And so we started this relationship and uh, she started to text me every time she got an old hot tub in the store or needed to get rid of something. And she would say in this kind of amazing, almost salesman-like pitch, we have a 2001, you know, spa galaxy model with blue uh, quartz 
finish. You know, she would just go on and on, almost like reading the kind of the pamphlet for it. Um, and she'd always try to kind of get me to, you know, take all of them, like, please take all of them. But instead, because uh, as you can see, it's a really large site, I started to just go and cut out sections of these hot tubs. And ultimately, the hot tub kind of, as I said earlier, it just provided too much information for me. Using an entire hot tub in a sculpture was too specific. Like it would just read as a hot tub sculpture. What I was interested in are these kind of wavy chip, like potato chip like forms when you really go in and cut out sections. And what was so great about having access to all of these different hot tubs is there were just many different colors, uh, different finishes. And so I would um, go with a, uh, like a Sawzall, connect a million extension cords to that store behind there and, and saw out kind of various sections of the hot tub and then slowly bring them back to Brooklyn. And I've been working with these pieces for, as I said, like over eight years, but I've kind of accumulated them over time to really create a, a large body of them. Um, and they've kind of been incorporated in and out of my work over the years. I just wanted you to see, um, this is where I'm sitting, but I thought just to have another kind of vantage point or viewpoint of the studio, where as I said, when I'm bringing these kind of, you can see the hot tub in the bottom right there, the kind of pinkish wavy form. When I'm bringing these things into the studio, there's this process of almost having to divorce it from where it came from, um, which might mean cleaning it, cutting it in a certain way to kind of eliminate details or kind of particular narratives, maybe a label or um, just something that roots it in a specific time and place. And as I said, the studio really kind of acts as this, this kind of, I don't know, scientific laboratory where this is the process where I, I I get to just sit and stare at these things for a really long time and figure out what do I want them to do? Uh, what are they telling me to do? Um, are they gonna be hung on the wall? Are they gonna just sit in the room? Do I need to add things to them? It's kind of this cataloging process where it's just kind of, it's like a factory kind of processing new uh, product and then figuring out where, where I go from here. And so just to kind of, um, I wanted to just give you a little bit more specifically uh, kind of start to finish of how I work with the models. So this is the table um, where I'm sitting, uh, where I, I make the models, but as you can see, the materials are, are very rudimentary. I basically just sweep the floor in my studio and that's what you see on the tabletop there. So it's, it's like little scraps of plaster and laminate and foam. And I, I usually make the models with foam core, just kind of foam. And I just, it allows me to just play in a three dimensional way. So I'm using a hot glue gun, it's very basic. Um, and then you can see this is kind of what I came up with. Um, and just to kind of give you the full picture, oh, there's a close up of the model. So you can see I'm, I'm thinking through different materials. There's thread in here. Obviously there's a, a big translation process when you scale up in material. So if I'm using thread in a model, like what would that be in real life? Like this piece was, I think it's like 23 feet long by, I don't know, 15 feet tall. It's, it's very large. And so, you know, thread in a model would need to be very large rope in real life. And then, you know, I'm, I'm using, you can see little bits of drywall and um, rubber. And so there's, there's definitely a translation, but it just allows me to take a drawing in my notebook just one step further. And so then this is the piece kind of in, in real life. Um, it's at Penn State, um, in State College, Pennsylvania. And it was in this, uh, 
it's like a theater building on campus. And it's definitely the most exuberant piece, I would say, that maybe I've made so far in that there's something interesting about it in that it faces this really large window that faces the street. And as you come for a theater performance, you would um, walk up to the piece and then go down the stairs and walk into the theater. So as you go down the stairs, you can actually just get quite close to the work itself. And so there's this kind of, you know, micro macro thing that happens where you can see it when you're driving in your car outside, but you can also get quite close to it as you're going to a theater performance. And so when I was kind of build this piece, I thought it really needs to kind of work on both of those scales. Like how can it really scream loud as you're driving by at night when it's lit up? And then how can there be these small elements that you discover once you're, once you're close up? So the piece has um, these kind of smaller details that I was really um, interested in kind of creating so that the viewers would have that experience. Um, and at the time, I went to a, I went to a Dolly Parton concert and she said, you always have to wear one thing that the people in the back can see. And I thought that's such a great piece of advice specifically for this piece, but also for my work in general, like what's the thing that the person in the nosebleed seats can see? Is it a really loud color? Is it in this piece, for instance, for me, it was this just explosive freeze frame, like stuck to a wall action. But then, you know, as you get closer, it starts to reveal itself through different layers and space. Um, so I thought that would be a good place to kind of stop the conversation. Um, I just wanted to, um, because this is the, the main thing that's on my mind right now, but I just wanted to kind of, um, as I speak to anyone I know right now, and those I don't know, like all of you, but I just really want to encourage everybody to get out to vote. Um, enough said, yeah, just get out and vote. But I just wanted to open it up to questions and maybe if anybody uh, wants to put some questions that they have in the chat and I can kind of answer from there, that might be the easiest way to go. Oh, great. Okay, so somebody says, I guess, can everybody read this? Uh, would you say that aspect of play is really intrinsic to your work? How as college students can we incorporate play to help influence our work? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, play is kind of where the work comes from. And I think allowing myself that kind of, um, that time to play is really necessary. And I think especially in school, for me, that kind of play came from experimenting with materials I didn't know anything about. Like for instance, I was a painting major in undergrad and then um, I also uh, got my MFA in painting and I knew nothing about sculpture. I'd never taken a sculpture class and I just decided that it's okay for me to try it. And I think somehow giving yourself some permission to just try things that you're not comfortable with inherently allows play because I felt like I didn't know how to use the right tools or use a table saw um, but once you kind of accept okay I'm a beginner and I'm gonna reach out to people to help me learn these things I felt like I came at it from a really different angle maybe than someone who totally studied sculpture the whole time in school um, so yeah I would say I mean this isn't just like as student thing this is like as a person in the world thing it's the like age old saying of try new things. But I actually think it's really, yeah, really important. And especially in my work that um, I'm doing on site, there was a huge um, 
you know, nervous hurdle I had to get over where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm showing up to a place and I don't have the sculpture ready to go. But trusting in that process of play and knowing that through that play process, I'll come to something maybe more interesting than, you know, bringing the sculpture that I had made ready to go. For me, it just kind of allowed for that. Um, hi, Heidi. Okay, could you talk about how you put together an exhibition proposal for spaces like Locust Projects? Yeah, that's such a good question um, because I feel like especially once you get out of school, that's a huge part of what artists are doing is putting together proposals, applying for things, um, applying to residencies. But maybe as you can see, most of my work depends on a space uh, agreeing to do a project. You know, like the work wouldn't happen a lot of the time if I didn't have a project just because of the scale. I can't just like build a whole show in my studio and then hope it fits somewhere. It's just not the way I work. So um, I look for spaces that are interested in that and specifically locust projects among others like um, the mattress factory, for instance, in Pittsburgh or um, like sculpture center here in New York, they're interested in projects that are specific to their space. Like they're not interested in just pulling out some sort of, you know, application you had for something else. And so I'm specifically looking for spaces that support my kind of work. Um, so that would be the first step. And then secondly, I find that with applications, even though this is a frustrating one to hear, but the more work you put into the application, the, be the better the application. And so even before I get a project, like if I'm making, for instance, I don't know, for the Sculpture Center's proposal, like they ask that you make a mock-up of what you want to do, uh, a site plan. So I'll make a, I'll make a model and I'll, I'll try to articulate the idea to the best, best, best of my ability and really try to flesh it out. Um, which is how Locust Projects first happened. It was like a, an explanation of what I wanted to do. Um, but in order to write that explanation, I had to make a model for myself, even though they weren't asking for it at the time. So yeah, I feel like that's an annoying answer just because it's like, you kind of have to create a lot of work for yourself. But I think all of that just starts to feed the application and then it always feeds the next application. Um, David, if you're working on site in a new location, how long do you allow yourself to scavenge for materials? Yeah, that's a really good question too. And one that um, I've kind of gotten, you know, better at over time. I usually, ideally at least a week of that, um, that would be like getting there looking for materials, making the piece. That's minimum a week. Two weeks would be ideal. A month would be perfect. Um, to me, the more I can experience a place and the longer I'm in it, the better the piece becomes. Specifically like um, for Locust Projects, um, it's gonna be a month and so I'll, I'll really feel like I'm living there and it's, you know, it's, it's going to be not only am I making the work, but I'm, I'm figuring out what the place is. And I think that's just really important. Um, I had a show in Buffalo earlier this year and I was there for a week and a half. Um, and I think as I, as I kind of go, I get faster. Um, and I can kind of zero in on things and do more work ahead of time before I get there. For instance, like source particular material, um, ask around if, you know, the people that work at the gallery have ideas for places to go. Maybe they can even go ahead of time and kind of scout what's there. Um, but as you might imagine, I'm, I'm one of these artists where people always feel like they have something I would love. Uh, and I often, really don't want what they have. It's kind of 
um, I don't know, like if you were to say, you know, oh, I, I need a black sweater and your mom or some, I got the perfect black sweater for you today. And you look at it and you're like, this is the worst black sweater I've ever seen scene and it's like how could you mess up something so simple but I really particular I think vision for what I'm after and I think sometimes it's really hard to articulate that and so often people will be like oh I'm tearing up my bathroom come over I have so many good things for you and I usually you know I don't usually do that sort of thing I did that thing early on and ended up with a lot of old toilets in my studio and it just wasn't it wasn't good um Nicholas it seems to me that there is something ephemeral about your site specific work. Is it possible to recreate that work at a new site? Uh, is the non-permanent nature of the work an important aspect for you? Yeah, the work is really ephemeral in that way. Um, and actually that's part of, I think, why I really enjoy making the models because after a show is over, it's, it's never gonna exist again in that complete format. I might take, kind of individual sculptures um, out of the show as kind of remnants, but it would never exist in that format because it's so particular to, to the space. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the models actually help me get over that hump because it's just something I get to hang on to as a reference point. When I'm thinking about the work moving forward, I can pull out a model and kind of, um, remember something I did that I liked or um, just to kind of have a physical record in addition, obviously, to documentation. And often I take video, which I'm sure many of you know, documentation is one of the most important things, I think, especially for work that is ephemeral, because it's the only record you have for someone that wasn't able to go in person. Um, that being said, I really, as an artist, I really like that, that going to see it in person is important, that seeing an image of it is not the same experience of being able to walk around the objects and be in the space, that there's something about the work being up at a certain space in a certain city, and that's its lifespan. And beyond that, it's only just kind of a memory in terms of photographs and models. Its lifespan ends when the show is over. Um, and I think for working with galleries or curators, I think that's a, sometimes a challenge. Um, but working in that way has allowed me so much freedom in terms of scale and the types of materials I'm working with that I feel like it, it gives me more than, you know, taking away in terms of uh, like what I, what I gain is more than what I lack, I think, um, given the ephemeral nature of it. It's also really opened up, um, you know, shipping really large sculpture is very expensive and it's allowed me to show in places that wouldn't have a budget otherwise to show my work if I had to ship everything in advance. And that kind of accessibility, I think, to my work is really important to me. Um, and often my work uh, is shown at kind of more institutional spaces and universities. And that allows me to kind of share my work with students and, and use students and Glenn interns and um, as people that are involved in the process of making. And they're the ones that can drive me around because they know the city to the spots to find the discarded material. And all of those types of relationships, um, I've just really come to value in my life as an artist. Otherwise, my life as an artist is pretty um, solitary. You know, it's a lot of alone time in the studio. And so when I can work with a group of people on a project and kind of be present and active, as active as possible in a city when I'm there, um, yeah, the better for me. So yeah, it's a good, it's a good question though. Um, David, so one of the first things I noticed about your work is your use of color. I think you have a very distinct color palette. Beyond the location, can you talk more about your relationship and the use of color? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that's something that comes up a lot. And it's also something that I felt like I wasn't really, I think I just didn't really have the language to speak about it for a long time. And it's, it's taken a lot of, I think, um, time making to understand it more. But I, a lot of the colors, you know, I'm, most of the colors are not applied. It's, it's in the things I'm working with, whether it's um, laminates or drywall or I don't know, Corian countertops. Um, they're all coming from this mainly domestic architecture materials, building materials. And I find that most domestic materials are meant to be pleasing to be around. You know, you wanna kind of feel calm and comfortable. And I think there's this, this really interesting, to me, kind of duality in how comfortable and yes, pastel and calming the colors are versus what the object is, which is often just like a really heavy, large building material that is nailed and drilled and sawed. Like there's all of these really kind of um, direct active actions taking place to these really calm, soothing color palettes. And so I think that's why I'm drawn to them. I think there's something inherently interesting to me about something being hard and soft, light and heavy, you know, um, girlish and boyish. I, like, I think the scale of my work starts to get at that too, where it's really large, but maybe it feels soft and comfortable and soothing in a way. But maybe the longer you look at it, there are these kind of dowel jabs and screws and folded things that starts to have a bit of a different read. Um, also, I feel like this is something that I take for granted a lot, um, but my mom is a, she would call herself a colorist, I think. Um, I guess I would say she's somewhat of an interior designer, but she only picks paint colors. And she's in Rockford, Illinois. So she's not, it's not, um, it's not like, uh, it's like suburban homes, Nissan dealerships, Dennis office that she's picking paint colors and the palette for. And growing up, I was just always surrounded by her Benjamin Moore paint chips. And she was always making these color charts to give the painter to then paint the Nissan dealership a certain color or paint the doctor's office or the lady that lives, you know, in the next neighborhood's living room. And there's something really, you know, it's like, oh, it's my parents' job, whatever. And then my dad is also um, a contractor, like he does construction work. And it's something that just was, you know, part of my life for a really long time. And it wasn't until after grad school that I think my parents came to for graduation or something. And one of my professors was chatting with them and they're like, oh, what do you do for work? And, and they mentioned it. And my, you know, my professor at the time was like, Katie, this, like, your parents are your work. How did this never come up? Um, and it's funny how sometimes the closest thing to you, you just don't see. And I think, I don't know, I think, you know, now I don't live near them anymore. And I think there's a bit of perspective that comes with that removal and just knowing that kind of this color palettes were always were always around me as a kid. Um, and my brother, I have a twin brother who's a painter too. And um, I think my parents are kind of like, what, like these two artists, what happened? But they're, they're so creative and they're so hands-on in terms of the way they construct things and um, the way they think through structures and space and color that I think somehow it just rubbed off. Uh, so yeah, so that's where I'm kind of coming from with the color. I think I'm actively right now trying to, I guess in my palette, like punch it up a little. Like, is there a way to bring in a kind of 
sharp red or a royal blue or a forest green um, to kind of maybe even highlight the pastels even even more. So that's kind of where I'm headed right now with the, the work I'm working on. David says, any last questions, anybody? Well, thank you all so much. This has been really fun. This is kind of my first kind of official artist lecture on Zoom. And um, yeah, I appreciate you all coming. And uh, thanks to Audrey and David for um, facilitating the visit. And, and yeah, stay in touch. Thank you, Katie. It was very gr great to hear you talk about your work. Um, and uh, I guess for everyone, uh, we'll see you around the art building. Um, Katie, I'll, I'll just go ahead and so we can talk for a second.